Hi. Mr. Kumar, just in time. Shall we? Just a sec. Can you get them, please? Sure. Hey. Hey. Hi. Let's go. Sorry, guys. This shoot is for the entrepreneur of the year. And they're all here. But how will they all fit? Five years ago, these people made space for my dreams. I think a photo is the least that we can do. Yeah, of course. Okay, let's move slightly back to. Where's Sham? Sham, come. Come. Come on, let's go. <laughs> when character has humility, it's rare. It's Platinum, presenting jewellery for men of Platinum. So good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to Jewellery Industry Voices, Sib Joe's monthly webinar series, hosted from me here in London, Edward Johnson. So welcome to all of you joining us all around the world today. This is the third webinar in our second series which we started at the beginning of September. Many of you were with us for our first series as well when we started in April. So thank you to all of you for joining our worldwide community of friends and members of the industry from all areas from mining through to retail. The series Jewelry Industry Voices looks as issues of interest in the jewelry business from the perspective of industry figures. And today in this third edition, we're gonna discuss the importance of focusing on meaning and the need to create demand with the consumer post pandemic. Thank you very much for our panelists who we'll be introducing shortly but before then, I would like to thank very much our Platinum sponsor, the Platinum Guild International. We're very proud that Hugh Daniel, the CEO, and the team at PGI have agreed to collaborate and support us in this second series of Jewelry Industry Voices. PGI was founded in 1975 and has specialist teams developing demand for Platinum Jewelry throughout the world via consumer and trade facing programs in four key markets, those being China, India, Japan, and the US. And what we played at the beginning is just one of those videos that they've been producing in India, focusing on men of platinum. We'll have an opportunity to see a few more of those stories because we are focusing on storytelling today that PGI are creating for platinum in India and in other markets. So we're gonna be having monthly webinars from now on. Um, please mark your diary for December 17th, when we will be next on again, a Thursday at two o'clock London time, whatever time it is for you around the world. As I said, my name is Edward Johnson. I'm based here in London. It's a sunny day today, I'm pleased to say. I'm also joined by Steve Benson, CEO Communications Director in Tel Aviv. Steve, good afternoon. You're on mute. Do you want to join and uh, welcome? Hi, everybody. Uh, it's sunny here as well, um, about 24 degrees, which is nice. Um, uh, I think we have a fantastic uh, um, uh, agenda today, and so I'm not going to delay it very long, except just to give a few technical details as I normally do. Um, the, uh, we're going to, the, the, um, the webinar should run about an hour. Uh, we do take, uh, we will take questions from the audiences. What we do request is that you put uh, questions in the Q&A box, um, and uh, at the end of the um, the session we'll come to those questions uh in some of the cases the uh the people that you direct the questions actually have the option to um to ask uh, directly and they might do that um but uh other than that uh, the chat box is open and uh, you can chat amongst each other um 
it um, and I'm not going to take things any further. So uh, Ed, uh, what what I'd like to do first is just invite Gaetana uh, Cavalieri, the president of Sibja, just to say a few words of welcome, and then we can get on our way. Gaetana. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much, Ed. I want to thank uh, our panelists. And, uh, and obviously, I want to thank uh, Platinum Guild International, you, Daniel, and all the team. Jen Jen, of course, uh, we have met uh, in Hong Kong uh, a few times. And uh, uh, is uh, about telling story uh, today. And I think that uh, the story of Platinum is uh, sensational for somebody that like uh, to read and know something about uh, the elements of the jewelry industry. So the precious metal, the stones, uh, uh, and uh, all the components that at the end bring uh, 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 the pieces of our incredible, beautiful industry to the consumer. Um, I think that uh, an institution and an organization such as CIPIO uh, is highly committed to bring uh, uh, to everybody and spread out the meaning of what the jewelry industry and the jewelry uh, uh, pieces, every single piece means in terms, of course, of uh, sustainability, transparency, in terms of uh, responsible sourcing, in terms of the responsibility of each one of us uh, towards uh, uh, the, the, the consumer who is uh, the main uh, uh, subject of our entire supply chain. Uh, let me thank you all again, and I wish that everybody will be happy to listen to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaetano, very much. So let me get started with our esteemed panelists today. Firstly, um, Zhen Zhen Liu. Based in Hong Kong, uh, Zhen Zhen has over 10 years experience in consulting, business development and sales and marketing across multiple reason, regions. Zhen Zhen, you're joining us from Hong Kong, so it's quite late at night there. So thank you very much for joining. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. And um, thanks very much for Sipjo for organizing this great platform um, for conversations um, of the, the jewelry trade and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Next we have Evert de Grave. Evert is also in the same time zone, sitting in uh, Shenzhen in uh, mainland China. Uh, so Evert has over 30 years experience of senior, senior jewelry management experience. He started his career in London actually as a goldsmith for David Morris. And he's held executive global design and product development positions at many well-known industry brands such as Harry Winston, Suna Brothers, Mikimoto and David Yerman. But, uh, Evert, you've been based in China for most of this year. How are you doing today? You're on mute, Evert. You'll just need to unmute, Evert. There you go. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this panel. Actually, I'm very honored and humbled to be part of this panel. And I would like to thank also uh, uh, Gatiano for his uh, introduction. And um, I would like to really uh, make sure that I can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Inazita Gay Eckel. Inazita is a jewelry historian and one of the founding members of Le Col, which is a jewelry school which is supported by Van Cleef. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpel in Paris. She is a jewellery expert with a focus on the history of jewellery and also with a special interest in platinum. She's previously worked for E&J Frankel, Cartier, Tiffany, 
and Van Cleef before being one of the founded members of L'Ecole. Inezita, welcome from, you're in Paris today as well, I believe. I'm in Paris, Ed and everybody. So glad and honored to be with you all. I'm going to rush off to the mad Paris Museum afterwards, Museum of Decorative Arts, to do another a lecture uh, on the history of Art Deco, which is going to involve platinum too, because platinum is key in 20th century jewelry history. Well, a very busy lady. So thank you so much for joining us today and giving us some of your, your valuable time. Delighted to talk about this incredible medal. Last but not least, Tarang Aurora. Born and raised in Jaipur, Tarang joined Amrapali in 2004. The brand itself was created by his father, Rajiv Arora, and his uncle, Rajesh Ajmera, in 1978. Amrapali is now one of India's most cherished heritage jewelry brands, with a retail presence in over 38 locations globally. Tarang also, I noted, has been voted one of India's best dressed men by GQ. So, Tarang, <laughs> what an accolade that is. Welcome to us. From, welcome to the webinar all the way from... Show Europe. that. Show it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for a flattering uh, introduction, Edward. Um, no, it's, it's, it's great to be um, um, on this panel, and I'm, I'm happy that I can bring um, an Indian perspective to things, be it uh, history or be it uh, the storytelling we're going to talk about today. So, uh, great to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get started. Before I get before I start with the questions, please note that none of the opinions or information that's offered today in this webinar constitutes any any advice, legal, financial, or official. Gia, um, Sibjo provides a global perspective on the gem and jewelry industry. So, for for more precise information, we encourage you to play an active part in your local trade associations and seek advice and information relevant to your location and business. So let's get started. Jen Jen, can we start with you and really thinking about finding meaning in a pandemic? Um, PGI recently has been involved in a lot of consumer research given the circumstances we find ourselves in. And can we ask you to start today's proceedings by going through some of the findings? You know, based on that research, and the four key markets that you focus on. I think really we'd like to find out what the key findings are in terms of changes in consumer sentiment and also behavior post pandemic. And I'll bring up your slide deck for you now. Great. Thank you, Edward. Um, well, um, maybe first allow me to um, to give some background of the survey, if you could move on to the next slide. Yeah. So during the second quarter, PGI uh, commissioned a consumer survey in our four key markets uh, for platinum jewelry um, to understand the change in consumer sentiment uh, during the COVID crisis and what it means for jewelry purchase afterwards. So um, the survey reviewed some findings. The first one is that, yes, of course, uh, COVID-19 has changed our life many aspects. Um, if you go to the next one. But one positive implication of the pandemic is that the majority of people um, started to reevaluate their life and their priorities in a positive way, as this chart shows, and appreciate companionship. Uh, with their family and their loved ones in this challenging time. And this is especially true for couples. And if you move on to the next one, the research also shows that precious jewelry sales could have a strong recovery after the COVID, uh, given its real value, um, as well as the emotional connection consumers um, place on uh, fine jewelry, especially um, after a long period of uh, anxiety. If you move on to the next one, um, it shows that um, majority of the consumers said they're willing to spend the same or more on jewelry after COVID 
um, both for gifting and for self-purchase and for four markets. And for the next one. And our survey also showed that um, after the pandemic, consumers are willing to spend more on jewelry um, that delivers personal meaning and maintaining value because um, this is very important for consumers to express themselves uh, in a difficult time to show gratitude to their partners, uh, to cherish special moments in their life, uh, especially when traveling and getting together becomes more difficult. And we believe this is creating an opportunity for plasm uh, because plasm is this rare and precious metal that you really consider um, as the metal of meaning and love. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Jen Jen, for that, that, that very focused uh, opening there. And, you know, all the research and the surveying that you're doing is telling us mainly that meaning and focusing on meaning and imbuing meaning in the jewelry that we sell to the consumer is crucial more now than ever before. David, can I talk to you? Can I start with you from your experience as a, as a modern jewelry designer in many different markets? Sure, thank you. Why should jewelers convey meaning in jewelry? Uh, uh, I think because platinum has uh, a sense of hope. You know, hope is one of my key words. And then love, love is really important in expressing platinum. Um, when you look at the price of platinum right now, uh, compared to gold, um, it, it still is a very big, big opportunity for the consumer to engage into a conversation uh, with their retailer about love, uh, about having, um, platinum be part of their um, sort of like portfolio, if you call it portfolio. Um, and I think that um, it really expresses a feeling of, you know, platinum is about strength. It's about, you know, it, it's about expressing something that uh, is really important for the consumer. But I also think that sustainability is a part of it too. Um, so I think that between hope and love, you know, platinum is, is about love. When you give a piece of jewelry to somebody, it's about expressing something that um, you want to express with love. It's about your heart. And as a designer, how, how, how can design elements change in response to conditions that consumers are experiencing at any point. I mean, we've experienced, a, um, and forgive me for the cliche, but an unprecedented set of circumstances in the past 10 months or so. And how can design react to that? So I think that that uh, innovation and technology is really important right now. Uh, I think, um, you know, craftsmanship, craftsmanship, understanding craftsmanship and platinum is really important. But I think what PGI and Hugh and and the uh, the whole PGI team has been doing is been investing into innovation for technology and for new design and new development. So, so I think that for the consumer, there there is going to be a huge opportunity for them to engage into um, investing in platinum. And looking at platinum as not just an alternative, but look at at a, a, look at platinum as a uh, a key issue to invest for their jewelry and their love. You know, in in China, where you've been for the past ten months, you know, the economy is is really powering ahead in many senses compared to other markets where we're experiencing either lockdowns or some of the challenges still from the pandemic. What's changing or what's changed in product development from where you're seeing it? And, and what more can the industry do to meet this shift? 
I, I think that uh, in China, I think their consumer behavior is is pretty par parallel. It's like um, it's continuing on the same kind of behavior. But I think that for platinum, I think that the consumer is looking at the value of platinum and looking at the design aspect. And I think they are uh, really looking at an opportunity for uh, new design and, and new expression to express their love and to express their their um, personal message for hope and for, you know, I, I refer to this as the sky's the limit. Mm. But there's always a limit to that. So I think that um, I think Platinum is offering something special to the Chinese consumer. And it's not taking away from, you know, what the Chinese consumer wants. It's like incremental sales. So for the retailer, I think that um, they, they are looking for incremental sales and looking at an opportunity to convey a message. So I think Platinum really conveys a message. Um, and I've been here for 10 months. I've been here for uh, many years. I, I, I've been coming to China since 1985. So I think that the Chinese consumer behavior is still something that PGI is now leading the consumer. They're not following, they're leading. Thank you. Inazita, can I turn to you over there in Paris? Uh, you know, we, we talked about the, the unprecedented circumstances brought around by this, this pandemic, but you've lived through other um, tragedies globally. We were talking about it the other day. I, I, how, what happens to people's jewelry purchasing behavior in times of crisis? And how can jewelry and platinum jewelry play a role in that? Jewelry is as serious and as sublime and as frivolous as we are as human beings. And every one of us has an angel and a devil inside us, which means that jewelry expresses all the aspects of us. 70% of talismans in Europe were always to protect children. Therefore, what happens is when we have a time, like for example, September 11th, I was director of marketing for Cartier on September 11th. The, exactly the antithesis of what we expected happened. The day we opened up the, the Fifth Avenue store again, we sold out every wedding ring. We sold out every love bracelet. People would buy a size 12 wedding ring for a size eight husband and give him it in a box and tell him to wait until the regular one got into stock. People went to expressions of concrete love. When you're in a time of crisis, what do you find out? What did we all find out? We're worried about our family. We're worried about our children. We're worried about our grandmothers. We're worried about those we love. When we celebrate again, when we turn to celebrate again, and it's what we do. Ed knows I promise not to talk about the Middle Ages, about 1348 and the Black Plague, but the fact is that what we do is we celebrate life. Beautiful, wonderful things come out of these crises. We are poised already now, and that's what we do. So what happens is be prepared, in my opinion, and as you said, this and a token will get you on the subway. Um, I teach now, I'm not an executive in jewelry anymore. What joy, I could just tell you about history. Um, I believe though, that people are going to seek out the most eternal memorialization of the people they care about and almost with a concrete sense of protection. This is concrete value and platinum. Well, don't get me started, but platinum is a metal, one of the three noble metals, but so special. Think about how platinum is so involved. I mean, every car that doesn't pollute has a catalytic converter with platinum in it. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about the historical significance of platinum, and I'll bring you back into the conversation, Den. But thinking about the historical context, I want to turn to India and I want to turn to Tarang. India has such a rich history in the use and the significance of jewelry. Now, why is jewelry so important in India? And how do you use that today 
in creating and maintaining a brand? Um, so Edward, um, India is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a country or a subcontinent full of cultures, full of different various religions, various people. Um, every 20, 30 kilometers, you'll have a different uh, um, god, goddess, different flavors in food, different dialects. So changes the jewelry and clothing as well. Um, since the beginning, it is the most important thing, uh, not just not just adorning, but also an investment purpose, you know, um, and and that's what we have always seen. Um, um, even in villages, we, you would see whatever a person would have, the extra money they would earn, they would try and buy a piece of jewelry and they will load it up on them. Um, we have my father and uncle um, started the brand in 1978, as, as, as you were saying. Um, at that time, when they were starting, uh, they were both history students and they wanted to start a brand or um, they, didn't, they didn't even think it's going to be a brand. They thought it was going to be a small business which they want to start, but anything to preserve Indian history. And uh, eventually today we have a Amrapali museum of such collection of pieces. So referring to those pieces, um, we have, we have anklets which uh, weigh up to uh, two kilos, each, one and a half kilo each in each leg um, in silver. And um, they were worn because and, and someone would wear it for the entire life. Uh, a father would save and, 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 and buy them for a daughter uh, when she is 14, 15, and, and leave it, and she would leave it on for an entire lifetime. And she would use it if there was bad times to sell it. Also, people were nomadic. People were moving from one place to the other. So they would keep these pieces on them. Um, I mean, we were talking about it the other day. There is there are pieces in our museum uh, which has uh, uh, which has inspiration from cactus. And I was talking to my dad, and I was saying, why does why does this earring have spikes? So my dad has said said that this is from Jaisalmer, which is the area in Rajasthan where where it's all desert. And and the only inspiration they get is not flowers, is cactus. So they designed really from cactus. So. There are so many such stories in India of uh, jewelry being um, such an important role and playing such an important role. David, you had something to add. Uh, yes, um, uh, I, I had. A, um, I, I worked for Harry Winston for a long time, and um, <clears throat> the, the son of Harry Winston, Donald Winston, is one of my dear friends, and I called him. Uh, about two weeks ago, and I asked him what was his medal of choice. So he replied to me, there is no, why are you asking me this question? What's the medal of choice? The medal of choice is platinum. You know, it's not a discussion. It's not something that uh, we can talk about. So I think that, you know, at, at Harry Winston, when, where you had Shindi, um, Indian designer, that was there for many years, designing for all of the royalty and all of the famous movie stars in, in, uh, in, in the U.S. And, and internationally. So I think that, you know, we, we, we're talking about platinum. So I think that... I really respect what uh, Tarang is saying, yeah. and I think that um, you know Indian design has been a key part of using uh, platinum too in the future, and and right definitely. now. Sorry. So yeah. so thank you. Thank Carry you. Carry on Tarang. Carry on Tarang. No, so I, I agree to uh, what you, you you were referring to, um, but but you have to also see the magnitude of jewelry in India is not. The, the kings and the queens of the or the or the or the upper class it's the masses and for them it and for yep. the masses it's where it was the savings for the for the for the king and the queens it was uh, opulence and, and and luxury and 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 fun and and to order it from maybe Cartier or Van Cleef and that also happened much later on in life uh, we are we are talking about I mean we have Harappa culture civilization on I mean since then so there's so many there's so many different areas, um, and then came the the times which which you were referring to as well. 
again, gold as well is such such an important part. And we, we, we learned all of that from the Mughals. And we learned a lot of enamelling from Mughals, a lot of paintings from Mughals. And we see that in Indian jewellery um, today a lot. So for us, I think for, 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 for my dad and uncle, when they started the brand, they had no place to go and see this jewellery. There's no place to go um, for an 18-year-old, 19-year-old designer who's, who's learning designing to go and see what Indian jewellery would mean or refer to in different parts of the states or different parts of the of, uh, of religion and, and, and society. Um, and that's what we have always been trying to create. And even as a, as a brand today, um, for our design team, for people who are traveling to Jaipur, we try and, we try and open this to, to everyone to learn and to see um, what was the thought process behind uh, jewelry, not just, not, just, not just adornment, but much more to that. Um, pieces where they put shivalingams um, inside a pendant. And Shivalingam is a is is a, is a Shiva praying uh, 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 little sculpture. Uh, there are, there are pieces where where women would wear earplugs and and they would open up and and their coin boxes. Um, uh, there are hair braids which were worn. Um, so there's so many different aspects of Indian jewelry, tribal, be it uh, Mughal, be it platinum. Um, so I think it's very important uh, uh, um, for India to have that. Um, uh, um, to still go on, you know. And you mentioned, and you mentioned your, your museum, the Amrapali Museum, Tarang. And you know, while we are all restricted from traveling, I do want to encourage participants to visit Amrapali's uh, um, Instagram feed, both for the brand, but also for the museum, which has a wonderful uh, uh, images from the, that museum. So we can't visit, but at least we can visit online. Jen, Jen, you had something to add as well. Yeah, um, I think thanks, uh, Avid, for being so passionate about platinum. But I do agree that gold, you know, it's it's uh, has much larger uh, volume, and it's it's being especially in India and also in China has traditionally, you know, has a, such a strong presence um, as a you know, um, especially in wedding. Um, you know, as a pre representation of uh, tradition, um, heritage, and wealth, um, and I think that's that's great. And the craft craftsmanship is is universal for um, all all types of jewelry. And I think for us, for PGI, we know that platinum is in many markets. It's is a, a relatively niche market compared to the volume of gold. And what we do is to um, really to add incremental um, needs um, for retailers to, to provide this opportunity for the, the customers, for the consumers, and mm -hmm. to differentiate from gold because gold is important, but plasma is also important and have a different um, equity because mm -hmm. you know plasma is um, yearly, um, you know, because of its physical uh, equity, um, it, it has a very, you know, high purity, it's strong, and it's yearly, you know, it's associated with um, love, commitment, um, and, and, and that's what we do in, in India, is we um, build aspiration and um, re uh, relevance through this uh, strong emotional equity that is different from gold. Um, and uh, in India, we actually have, you know, this brand called Platinum Days of Love. Uh, we introduced about a decade ago. Um, and, you know, in mo most people know that in India, uh, the weddings is for, um, you know, the um, build on the arrange the social contracts uh, between two families. But we also understand from the consumer uh, insights uh, research that consumers, especially young um, young generations, they crave for love, they crave for intimacy uh, within this social norm. And they want to use um, something to express uh, their love. And um, that's why we introduced this brand and the products called Platinum Love Bands to symbolize the, the discovery of love between uh, a couple within the social norm. So I think, okay. you know, we want to show that platinum is something, you know, 
uh, is meaningful. It's a matter of meaning and love. Thank you. I, Avid, I want to come to you, but just before that, I just want to bring in the historical um, context from, from the jewelry historian in the room. Uh, in Azita, tell us about Platinum's historical role uh, among the group of what GIA calls the three noble metals. I mean, wh when did Platinum become recognized along with gold and silver? They, it's connected to silver and in a, in a beautiful way. Um, silver is probably the earliest of the noble metals. Humans have valued these metals because they shine. And the, and the silver still takes the shine with the hand the most easily and the most glossily. Platinum, when it was used, it was probably, we find evidence of it used by the Egyptians, but it's used probably not deliberately. It was mixed because sometimes it's in uh, alloys, natural alloys with gold and with silver. So it, it wasn't specifically identified as much as we'd like to say it. The South America, the people who were in America, the original peoples had identified it. There's proof and they knew what it was. Now they had access to it. They had it around. And when the Spanish started their depredations and I'm part Spanish, so I can say it uh, in South America, they came across, they were you know, rampaging around looking for silver, plata and gold to ship back to Spain. And when they were looking for plata, if you look at the ore of platinum, it looks almost identical. So they found this other stuff that they thought was silver. And they had it, one thing you gotta say, the Spanish had great goldsmiths. So the goldsmiths went to work on it and tried to melt the silver, this plata, and they couldn't. So they started making these piles of stuff they called platina. Like I'm Inezita, I'm little Inez, like the little less important one in a way, the little baby one. Well, the platina was the little silver, the less important silver, because we can't figure out what to do with it. But they knew there was something about it. So the battles go on through the centuries of scientists trying to figure out what to do. I don't know if you want me to show the... We'll show it in a minute, if okay. that's okay, when we, when we talk but again. But the scientists uh, know there's something about it. And it's really not until it doesn't burst on the scene to make a real difference until the 19th century, until the second half of the 19th century. And then it becomes the metal of the 20th century because it's synonymous with technology triumphing, it's synonymous with the fact that you have to have above 1600 degrees centigrade to even melt platinum. You have to have special eye covering, you have to have special torches. And it became absolutely expressive of the, of the modern glamor and modern technology. And we'll look at some of those pieces in a minute when, when, when we think about the history of it. But I'd like to turn, uh, as well as talking about the uh, historical context, I'd like to think about jewelry as a, as a talisman. And I'd like to go back again to India, um, because Tarang, of course, spiritualism and, and wearing jewelry as a protection is important in all cultures, but especially so in India. And I'd, I'd like if you can to share, and I'll share some images of your Amrapali's Navaratna jewelry. Um, here's, here's, here's one, and I'd just like you to explain a little bit about the importance and what Navaratna jewelry is in India. So um, it, Nav, Navaratna is a concept and, and, and uh, um, is, a, is, a, is a belief which um, has been in India since ever. I, to be honest, we don't know for how long since it's been there since since we have known and since people have always uh, sort of Indian jewelry has existed. Um, usually there is a pattern uh, the way it is. It's always three, three and three when it comes in a, in a ring. And that is how it was originally very, very um, uh, uh, important and worn. Um, it's, it's today when we talk about it, it's the easier way to explain it is the nine gemstones for nine planets. But it actually meant one stone for uh, a ruby for um, uh, for sun, pearl for moon. Um, there are two stones for the ascending and descending uh, uh, nodes of the lunar uh, uh, lunar nodes, and the rest for other planets. Um, the belief is that if you wear them, they, you keep all these astrological powers, astrological uh, 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 astrological beliefs in in your favor. In your, it's it's like a good luck charm. Um, not just Navratna. Um, we have had multiple um, theories like that, or in Indian astrology, multiple things like that. 
um, wearing emerald in the in the small little finger for prosperity in business. Um, uh, blue sapphire is worn um, in in India only when a priest tells you, and 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 there's a process. You 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 are are told how many carats, and and when you are okay with it, then you take the stones and you sleep um, for a week. For you keep it for a week under your pillow and you sleep. And you think about the dreams you get, and if every and, and the, all the dreams have been good, there have been no nightmares. Then you put the stone on a on your in a cloth and on your arm for a week, and if there, everything goes well, no accidents, then you wear it in your pendant or a ring, whatever has been told. So there is, I think, such an important part. And then if we talk cross culture, evil eyes, hand of Hamsa, mm. multiple concepts like this. I think it is. Uh, I think it's a sub. Consciously, a belief in in, in positivity, yeah. uh, a belief towards uh, a, a better today and a better tomorrow. And uh, yeah, thinking about positivity and better todays and tomorrows, bridal jewelry, of course, reaches a whole new level when you look at it with an Indian lens on. And if I can share again, also some some images of bridal jewelry from some of your collections, from an Indian perspective. <coughs> Why is bridal jewelry and weddings so important for the jewelry business? So, um, Edward, there is um, what we believe, and this is not just our industry. We would, I would like to say, fashion, um, uh, uh, um, cloth, um, clothing, fashion, um, hotels, um, beverages. If you want to say alcohol, the highest consumption is during weddings, or the main consumption is during weddings. Indian jewelry, I could say. Over fifty percent runs because of Indian weddings, um, and uh, you have to understand it is not uh, um, it is not a wedding between two people. It's a wedding uh, between two large families. Usually, usually uh, um, uh, joint families. Uh, usually people not just buying for the bride and the groom, but also for the aunts and the uncles and the. And the, and the father-in-law and the mother-in-law buying jewelry as well for their daughter's wedding. Um, also creating heirlooms, very very important. This is a piece which my mother wore or my grandmother wore for her wedding, and I'm wearing it for my wedding. Um, we have created pieces for clients, men's jewelry, and and they have they have one they have they have four boys in the family. Um, in a joint family, and and the the, the client told me, I'm going to have this headpiece given to each and every boy as he gets married over 10 years time or 12 years time. So that kind of planning, uh, when it comes to jewelry, and it happens in India. And from the platinum uh, 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 point of view as well, if you see, in India we love spending money on on a wedding, as as, as when I started with, right? So the idea of a wedding band. Uh, I, and a, and an engagement ring has become so important and has started coming in so much as well these days. We have couples even even doing that today and 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 loving the fact that there was a proposal and there's a wedding band or an engagement ring, which wasn't a traditional way of, uh, in India. But that has also started happening. And um, and and from the platinum perspective, I, one more thing is that Indians always. Buy jewelry as as I was saying for investment purpose as well. So now when the plat when platinum is marketed well in India, which we see more so every year, I think it's a growing market. We see people understanding the value for it and understanding the value of the metal, not in just in terms of design, but also in terms of a precious metal. And um, and I think that really helps um, keeping. The Indian bridal scene on, you know. Yeah, thank you. I, and if we turn on the other side, away from India to to platinum and and bridal jewelry, Jen Jen, can I bring you into the conversation? Why is platinum best place for use in bridal jewelry in in the other markets that you serve as well as India? Think about Japan and China and the U.S. Yeah, I think you know in many markets. Um, platinum is, um, you know, always considered as the the finest jewelry, the best of the best. Um, platinum, is, you know, has a, a very strong um, durability and density. 
and makes it a very good choice for setting uh, diamonds and gemstones. And plasmum's purity and rarity and being precious uh, make it an ideal option uh, for making uh, important moments in life. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you know, uh, in the US, the diamond jewelry um, dominates in the, in the bridal segments. And the majority of the, um, the consumers actually prefer their diamonds um, to be set in a metal that has strength, um, never fade or tarnish, um, can hold diamonds securely, according to research. And platinum scores very high on those criteria. So, you know, in, in the US, PGI team actually developed this um, platinum chrome campaign and program in recent years to promote um, plasma has for better securing diamonds and gemstones uh, for jewelry that means a lot to consumers. And right. um, if we look at Japan, plasma is highly preferred, uh, both in bridal and non-bridal, because its natural white color and high purity actually reflect um, Japanese appreciation of subtlety um, and authenticity. And we see that plasma dominance in um, the Japanese market for both engagement rings and wedding bands, and is always linked with high quality jewelry in general. Right, thank you. Thank you, Jen-Jen. Yeah. Inazita, I'd, I'd really like to turn to you and this, this wonderful piece on the screen now, this sugar bowl by Mark Etienne Gianetti. Tell us about the importance of this, why you wanted to share it with us, and also why is France so intrinsically linked to platinum? So much. France is so, people tend to sweep away and forget that France was at the absolute pioneering forefront on science. I, the, the reason we pasteurize things is Louis Pasteur, but it, Jean Etienne was a perfect example of how so much of the invention and innovation was going on in France. Jean Etienne was someone who was trying to figure out the answers to this riddle of how to make metal out of this platina, this platinum, platine, the French are now calling it, what to do with it. And Jean Etienne, way back in the in the 18th century, before the French Revolution, figured out a procedure. This procedure involved making great clouds of cyanide. And right in his own house over on the left bank, he was making these giant clouds of cyanide come out in his house to create, to make platinum. It was a very difficult method. Obviously not a method that was physically, that was uh, business practical for the moment. It's another Frenchman named Chabano went over to the King of Spain. And of course, the King of Spain had piles of this stuff. And Chabano and Janity were both working on it. The King of Spain sent Chabano over to France to, to work with Janity. The two of them worked together. Chabano made a giant chalice that he gave to the Pope, kilos of it. And Janity made a coffee and sugar and creamer set for the King, for Louis XVI. He presented it to Louis XVI. You look at that, you think I'm showing you a piece of silver, right? No, that's a platinum creamer that's in the Metropolitan Museum. He, show, he gave this to Louis XVI in platinum and Louis XVI declared, now there is a medal fit for a king. Don't get me started. Louis XVI was actually a great guy. He was a reformer. He wanted to make watches. He was a watchmaker at heart. In my opinion, he was a good man. I think Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI are the most misunderstood people in history. I can bring myself to tears thinking about them. But anyway, well, let's not start with that. Let's just fast forward. All those heads were lost during the revolution, but somehow Janity survived. He went down to the south of France and he fixed clocks quietly. The French government the revolutionary government now wants to make a new way of measuring, don't they? They drive, they drive us all nuts forever. Janity came back and he actually made the kilo and the meter, the standards for them, in platinum. Yeah. After the revolution. And I'd encourage people to look for those online, the, uh, the examples of Janity's um, uh, standardized measures. Uh, I, I'd like also to think about, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I want to move it on a little bit, excuse me, but uh, you know, the, the Platinum's role in the style revolution really happened during the Belle Epoque period. And tell us a little bit, if you can, briefly about these two wonderful ladies here and the jewelry they symbolized. Promise to be brief. The Belle Epoque, beautiful period. 
um, it's the period before World War I. It's the period when people have the Industrial Revolution and they, there's relative well-being and people think that everything is going to get great. And um, these two ladies are sort of two sides of the people that made platinum the great, amazing metal of the late 19th and 20th century. On the right, we have Mrs. Cornelius Vanderbilt, and she's wearing a jewel. Notice the jewel around her neck. There are many jewels, but notice the jewel around her neck. On the left, we have Labello Tarot, uh, the diva, the diva from the stage. One of her nicknames was the Siren of Suicides. She's covered with platinum. And what's interesting is if we go to the next slide, we see two pieces of jewelry that belong to these two ladies, same proportion. The one on the left belonged to Lavello Tarot. The one on the right belonged to Mrs. Cornelius Vanderbilt. Platinum is also involved in the great leveling that the diva from the stage who was a Spanish orphan who becomes covered in jewelry and with trunks of jewelry can wear indistinguishable jewelry in terms of its opulence from Mrs. Cornelius Vanderbilt. One other quick story, the one on the left is the Bellotero, this lady who had made her fortune on the stage, brings a diamond jacket. So one of her admirers had given her a whole jacket made of diamonds, puts it on the counter of Cartier and says, I'm tired of the jacket. Make me a better version of Marie Antoinette's necklace, but make it for me with the new metal, platinum. And I want it to be like a net, like a gentle, delicate net. That's the piece on the left, long gone, disappeared. Piece on the right, was the Vanderbilt piece that we saw around her neck. Yeah. We thought that was gone too. But just recently, thanks to people talking about these things, the, one of the motifs, one of the upper motifs that dangles was found and Cartier was able to buy it for their museum. And you'll see it in Cartier Museum exhibitions. That's it. Thank you. And there's another collection that we encourage people to, to look out for online, the Cartier collection. Of course, all those amazing pieces, many um, bought back so that they're not for sale anymore and they sit in the Cartier collection. Thanks for that. I, I, I'd like really now to move on to what's really uh, many jewelers are struggling with, which is having to operate online and in a digital world. How do we actually convey some of this meaning and some of this history and some of this provenance that we've been talking about? Uh, Evert, to what degree does jewelry sell itself in a digital environment and you know is it is it possible to convey meaning online or do we have to go into a store and speak to a knowledgeable salesperson Evert you're on mute you're good good to go Evert yeah I think it's both I, I just had a bad uh issue of hiccups Oh, sorry. Uh, Should we come back to you in a minute? You all right? No, I'm okay. Okay, go for it. So I think that, um, you know, digital and, and on uh, brick and mortar uh, is going to be the same. So the experience is still going to be that a consumer wants to touch something and see something in person. So I think for um, what I'm, I'm seeing in China is like, obviously uh, there's a huge upsurge for um, uh, on, online sales. At the same time, you know, when I go to Chengdu and go to the Tagali Mall and I watch people walking around and going to a Tiffany store going to uh, LVMH or Gucci or uh, Cartier or even a Harry Winston store or Mikimoto in the IFC mall. Uh, I think it's still about the personal interaction. Yeah. yeah. And I think for, for, for Platinum, you know, it's still going to be about experiencing something that's going to be real. I mean, I, I have my Platinum engagement ring that I've been wearing for 35 years. And and it's something that I will never give up because it expenses love, strength, and, and uh, commitment. So I think that uh, that's really important. I also think that one part, one part that we didn't cover is sustainability. 
that's a really important part. I'm conscious of the time, so I just want to move on if I can. Um, sure. Sorry. Thinking about storytelling, uh, Jen Jen, from PGI research, what kinds of jewelry and brands do you think are best placed to capture opportunities pandemic? And how should they really focus on storytelling going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, as we just discussed, coming out of the pandemic, consumers will definitely um, lean towards meaningful brands and jewelry to celebrate, um, you know, milestones and relationships. Um, and we think jewelry in the, in the symbolic meaning category is likely to be boosted. And also uh, with everything that has been going on, you know, jewelry might not sit at the top of people's mind and brands or products with a story that um, resonates with consumers will be preferred. And we have been really addressing exactly that with our partners um, across the world, um, developing branded collections based on um, the desires and for today's consumers and telling a differentiated story around plasma uh, with a credible attributes, like how plasma is reserved for um, special moments in people's life that matters to our consumers. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, in thinking about the storytelling and, and moving to you, Tarang and Amrapali, how important is storytelling to your brand and, and why? I think uh, what we are representing here, um, 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 as you know, Edward, we are in London as well, and that's how we met uh, when I was uh, um, in London in, uh, in 2002, and, and then we opened our boutiques there. Um, it is educating them of Indian jewelry. For us, that is our mission, um, to educate, to tell people about Indian jewelry, Indian craftsmanship. And all of that can be done with a, with a, with a story, with a, with, um, and what better than social media today and, and, and online presence? Um, what better than webinars such as this, what we are doing right now, um, and, 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 and having a, a group of uh, people discussing on these things. So I think storytelling is one of the most important parts. Um, um, for us, it's been the most important because as I said, we are the point of difference sitting in the markets where we are, be it London, be it New York, um, and, uh, and, and we are educating our clients with that. Online, I want to add something what we were talking about before about online versus brick and mortar. Yes. Um, I think online is a great uh, uh, way of retailing and it's, it's picked up extremely, uh, um, a, it's picked up a lot this year because of obvious reasons. Um, but I think brick and mortar stores are still going to be very important once this is all over. What we are going to eventually learn, according to me, and this is, my, this is what I feel, is that we have added more clientele and, and we have more people now uh, um, spending time. And, and there's, a more, there's a big group of people, call it millennials, call it younger people who just want, would want to buy something which is maybe a platinum band or maybe something which is very simple and they want to, they can access it very easily over the internet. So I think for one of a kind pieces, for specialized pieces, people will still go to brick and mortar stores, but things which are, simple, which they know of, are going to be easily uh, uh, bought, compared, and seen as a global village, right? You can see what, what, what uh, Hong Kong is doing and what New York is doing, what Italy is doing, and, and compare them and buy them online. Mm. Now, I think you're speaking from a, a place of solid experience there. Your Instagram um, pages uh, number uh, almost seven or 750 thousand followers so you have a very large presence online and it's important to think about that storytelling and what you're doing there i just want to turn to all of you in terms for some final thoughts we are turning the corner on the hour so yet again it seems that we've failed to finish within the hour but we're <laughs> right at the end now with some brief final thoughts i'd like to turn in azita to you first what do you consider to be jewelry's role in society, especially now post pandemic? Jewelry's role in society is something to hold on to. It's something to commemorate, something that's tangible, that can, can, conveys exactly what matters to you and your family and those you love. 
no matter what that is, whether it's the wedding ring, whether it's the pendant that your mother gave you when you were going off to college, whether it's the Ganesha, I have a Ganesha, which was given to me when I was starting Princeton. And it's one of the most important things I've ever had. It's made me love Ganesha forever. But it, I don't have to be Indian to love that. It's, it, it's a concretization of what matters. So if it's a concretization of what matters, you want it in a metal that's going to last. And yeah. that's one of the reasons why I love all three. I love platinum, gold, and silver for all those reasons. But platinum uh, is very, very special. Thank you. Taran, can I ask the same question to you? What do you consider to be jewelry's role in society, briefly? I think from our perspective, as, I, as we were talking the other day as well, that in, from India, um, and during this pandemic, I think it's been very clear, people have invested in the share markets across the world. There's been, there's been uh, oil a market has crashed, share markets have crashed. The only thing which is sustained are these three metals, right? Mm -hmm. The things which there hasn't been a major shift. If there has been a little correction, there has been. So from even from that perspective, it is so important to have, I think, I think to have one of these uh, uh, with you. And 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 uh, as Enazita mentioned, that that it is that is that um, tangibility is that is that having that in your hand and loving it and 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 having those memories, for example. And, and what you can't have, it's, it's difficult to store those memories in a book for 50 years, 40 years versus a metal, a precious metal. Great. Jen Jen, your final thoughts as well, jewelry's role in society. I think um, jewelry, definitely agree with, uh, you know, um, just as said, and jewelry is something that is embedded in building relationships, rituals and culture, like, we introduce this ritual of exchanging pairings in China and platinum become an integral part of the modern style weddings in China. And, you know, jewelry has sentimental value as a symbol to mark meaningful relationships and special moments in pe people's life. And it's deeply personal. And the giving and receiving and wearing jewelry on special occasions is really of some symbolic meaning in our culture. We right. don't have that for our smartphones, but we have that for jewelry. Thank you. Nice thoughts to, to end with there. Um, Avert seems to have disappeared off the line for a minute, but I know his thoughts very much on the purpose of jewelry is about conveying hope. And goodness knows we all need more hope in our lives at the moment, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we do have some time for some Q&A. We do have uh, a question here in the in the Q&A box that I'd like to put, perhaps if I can bring Shenzhen back in. Um, we've talked about all these trends and, and the areas that you've identified. Um, what is the what is the implication of all this on jewelry sales for the upcoming holiday season? Um, so I think first is that I, I mentioned the, the jewelry in the symbolic meaning category is, uh, is going to recover faster. And also we have seen um, actually a strong recovery um, in wedding demands, uh, bridal jewelry uh, in markets like the US and in China um, because of the postponed weddings. And also because people, um, some, some couples reduce the size of the wedding ceremonies or have to cancel their honeymoons, but, um, but they still want to spend money on wedding um, jewelry because that's important to to uh, to symbolize their you know commitments and love um, and also I think for the holiday season um, jewelers really need to adapt to the new normal as we talk about you know upgrading the online um, offering digital offerings and also they need to show that they care about their customers through uh, messaging and um, communications and product offering. Um, and in terms of Plasm, because, you know, for PGI, I think Plasm is well positioned in this holiday season um, because the holiday season this year, especially is about showing love, showing hope, uh, support and appreciation um, towards family and um, their loved ones um, and enjoying special moments of life, even during adverse times. Um, so I think, you know, this is a good, good time for uh, jewelers to provide um, pl plasma jewelry as well. And, and just the last question to Tarang, I mean, when we talk about the holiday season, of course, that's a very sort of Euro-US 
centric viewpoint. You're in the middle of a major selling season right now with, with Diwali and the wedding season. How, given the pandemic and the situation, how is the market in India at the moment? So it is deviving, definitely. I think um, in terms of numbers, we are we are the second most, second highest in the world at the moment, and 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 things are things are not really good in in that in that aspect. But things are under control, hopefully, as we are a huge population as well. Um, but but things are getting better. Um, also, as I was saying before, in online is such an important part. Um, we have two brands, sub brands of Amrapali Tribe Amrapali, which is a which is a, a price point silver um, and fashion jewelry brand, which has done fantastic online during this time. And we are launching Legend Amrapali, which was only an American centric brand for the Indian market and across the world as well. And that is done because we are seeing more and more reasons and questions from our clients to be able to shop online. So there is still the market. There is still hope. Is it going to be as much as before? Are people going to socialize as much? Are Diwali parties, festivities will be as much as before? No, definitely not. So maybe their spending is going to be less, but it's still going to be there. And they want to still buy a precious metal in that for that money. They don't want to go and um, spend it elsewhere. Um, so so I, think, I think that is very important. Tarang, thank you so much for your time. We're uh, eight minutes past, so I'm going to wrap it up now. Tarang, thank you so much for joining us and bringing all of that color and light and energy from, from India to the conversation. Uh, Inazita, thank, thank you so much also to you for joining. As you and I said before, we could do one whole webinar on platinum in itself and the history of. Maybe we'll think about that for the future, but thank you so much for joining today, this afternoon for you in Paris. It was a real pleasure and an honor to meet you all. And Same finally, time. Jen, and we seem to have lost uh, Avert. So in absence, I say thank you to Avert and, and wish him well over there in, uh, in China. And Jen, Jen, thank you so much to you as well for, for helping us to put all this together. And um, we wish you a good rest of your evening as well. Thank you. I'll finish this evening. I know that uh, Steve Benson and Gaetano have to leave to go to some other meetings. So I'll finish today by playing just one more of these stories that PGI has been developing. This is another video for the Seasons of Hope campaign. As I leave you all, I wish you all well. UK is still in a lockdown and I know many other people are around the world. So I encourage you all to please follow the guidance issued by your governments. Stay safe, stay with family, stay with friends, look after yourself. And until next month, December 17th, when we'll be back with you, we wish you all a very nice rest of your day or evening. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Bye. Thank you. So, your work from home setup is officially shut. What's this for you? B, five years ago, you set up your life here. Took care of mum, so I could set up mine in Mumbai, Singapore. This is for all of that. Thank you. For when you realize what truly matters, presenting Platinum Season of Hope. Choose Platinum as we bring hope to the lives of migrant workers. Thank you, everybody. Just, um, just my opportunity to thank again um, the Platinum Guild International, PGI, our Platinum sponsor for season two. Also, thank you to Natural Diamond Council as our diamond sponsor. And next month, We'll be joined by our new sponsor, GemCloud, where we'll be talking about technology in the colored gemstone supply chain. Please join us on December 17th. You'll be getting an invitation shortly. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.